Hello, everyone, and welcome to the podcast. We have a very special guest with us, Mr. Peter Schiff, who is going to be working with us to explain all the ins and outs of the latest updates financially, both here in America and throughout the world. Once again, if you are new, please do like and subscribe and share. Hit the notification bell so you don't miss a minute of the action. As we always do, as customary with new guests, we read their bio to set the proper expectations so that you know his background, and then we will get started. So here we go. Uh, Peter Schiff began his investment career as a financial consultant with Shearson Lehman Brothers uh, after having earned a degree in finance and accounting from UC Berkeley in 1987. Financial professional with over 30 years of experience, he's the owner of Euro Pacific Asset Management, uh, chief economist and global st uh, strategist for Euro uh, Pacific Capital, which is a division of Alliance Global Partners and chairman of Schiff Gold, a precious metals dealer based out of Manhattan in New York City. He's also the host of the Peter Schiff uh, Show podcast, an expert on money, economic theory, international investing. Peter is a highly recommended broker by many leading financial newsletters and investment advisory services. He holds several FINRA licenses, such as examples of Series 4, 724, 27, 53, 55, 63, and 65, respectively. Peter achieved national notoriety in 2008 as being one of the few economists to have actually accurately forecasted the financial crisis well in advance. Between 2004 and 2006, he made numerous high profile statements predicting the bursting of the real estate bubble, significant declines in national real estate prices, as well as the collapse of the mortgage market and banking sector, the bankruptcy and bailout of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Peter has also authored several best selling books, including Crash Proof. Crash Proof 2.0, How an Economy Grows and Why It Crashes, The Little Book of Bull Moves and Bear Markets, as well as The Real Crash. He has also served as an economic advisor to Ron Paul during the 2008 presidential campaign. All that being said, Peter, thank you for being on the podcast. How are you doing today? I'm doing well, John. How are you? And oh, by the way, I gave up all those FINRA licenses uh, oh. at the end of last year, so I'm finally FINRA free. Ah, oh, uh, good for you. I, I, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I wish the U.S. government would abolish FINRA. I don't think we need it. Uh, the same thing with the SEC. I think we'd have a, a, a much more honest, much fairer, uh, uh, you know, system for individual investors if the government got out of the way. Uh, but that, that's a topic for a whole other podcast. <laughs> I couldn't agree with you more. We could do a whole a whole segment just on that, a hundred percent. And I, we're going to talk about the SEC. Funny you mentioned that towards the end of said podcast. I had a friend who was a uh, chief compliance officer, so I am somewhat familiar with the FINRA's 24 and 63 and the like, so I can appreciate what goes into that. Um, Peter, speaking of which, we have a lot to cover, so let's get started on that. I'm going to start in this particular order. Um, you began your career as a stockbroker, like you said, at Sherson Lehman back in the early 90s. Can you tell us a little bit about your career in securities and what happened that pushed you to be an advocate of precious metals? Was there one moment or was a collective uh, series of events that happened that kind of made you realize the importance of precious metals? Well, I, I've always uh, been an advocate of gold uh, since long before I was in the investment advisory business or, or the brokerage industry. Um, and so I, I believe that gold is uh, the best form of money. It's the form of money that the founding fathers um, created for this country in the Constitution. Uh, you know, we've been on gold standard. We started with the Coinage Act of 1789, which defined the dollar as a weight of gold and silver. And basically, uh, you needed $20 to buy an ounce of gold up until uh, they created the Federal Reserve in 1913. And then it stayed at $20 an ounce until Roosevelt devalued the dollar in the 1930s when uh, it went up to $35 an ounce. Mm -hmm. But as we're speaking today, it's at a new all-time record high, just below $2,670, or $2,600, yeah, $2,660, just below that. But right. it's a new all-time record high of about another $30 today. And, you know, it, it's not that gold is going up. It's just that the dollar is losing value. And so you need more and more dollars to buy the same ounce of gold. Gold hasn't changed. It's just the value of the, the paper that's 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 changed and it's gone down and it's going to go a lot lower in the, the days, weeks and years ahead. Mm -hmm. So people would be smart to convert whatever savings they, they, they have out of paper dollars and into real money, into gold, into silver uh, before the prices go much higher. 
Couldn't agree more. And and we've been watching this, Peter, on our side, which obviously you wouldn't know until recently, uh, to, to encourage people to become their own central bank. And what better way to do that? Um, your warnings of economic collapse have earned you the nickname <laughs> Dr. Doom, but you were proven right in the 2008-2009 real estate crash in Great Recession. But since then, as you you said the U.S. is in even more debt, and we seem to be on the precipice of an even bigger global, a global crisis. Can you elaborate on what you see is on the horizon and what's in store for the U.S. economy? Yeah, you know, what's coming is a lot worse than what we experienced in 08. Um, you know, I think what, you know, is coming next will make that look like, uh, you know, the Sunday school picnic. Mm -hmm. And what this crisis has in common with the past one, other than the fact that the root cause is the same, which is the, the Federal Reserve. But it's that nobody can see it coming. The same uh, you know, leaders on Wall Street, in government, in academia, who were completely blindsided by the 08 financial crisis, they're, they're, they're oblivious to the crisis that's about to happen, which is going to be much, much worse. Because it's not just going to be a, a crisis in mortgage debt and in housing, but it's going to be in U.S. Treasury debt. We are going to face a sovereign debt crisis and a U.S. dollar crisis. And from that crisis, there's no bailout. Because the way the government was able to bail us out of the financial crisis was by printing a lot of money. They called it quantitative easing. But they basically created inflation to, to try to prop up the economy. Uh, but they can't do that when the dollar is the crisis. When the dollar is collapsing, printing more dollars just fuels the fire. So we're about to go into a crisis from which there is no exit. And in fact, to the extent that the Fed goes back to its tricks, which it's already indicated it's heading because we just cut interest rates. If the Fed keeps cutting rates and goes back to QE as the economy weakens and the crisis gets worse, it's going to blow up into a much bigger calamity uh, than before because the Fed's um, stimulus is actually going to be a sedative. And the more inflation the Fed creates to try to deal with the problem, the greater the actual problem becomes. Yeah, it's, uh, it's almost a self-fulfilling prophecy in many ways. Um, you, you mentioned a really good point, Peter, a few minutes ago when you were starting up on, on your history a little bit about the gold standard and how we started with that. And I agree with you. We need to go back to sound constitutional money. And this isn't so much to be political, but the season we're in, it's kind of inevitable, you know, not to talk about it in terms of an election. Um, it seems that President Trump, should he become elected, is looking to uh, audit the Fed, uh, you know, bring back the gold standard. You know, he tried Judy Shelton in his first term. I think he's going to do a reprise of that. So with that being said, do you think that we will go back to a gold standard? And if not, what do you think is going to happen in the future of the dollar and the monetary system? Well, I think a return is inevitable. The question is how we get there uh, mm -hmm. and what kind of crisis is it going to take before, you know, there's any political will to do it. And I think before the government uh, moves officially back to a gold standard, individuals will adopt it on their own uh, because they will be able to divest of dollars and, and hold gold instead. Uh, the same with our international uh, trading partners. That's already happening. I mean, the, the big buyers of gold this year have been foreign, foreign central banks. Americans have still foolishly been selling their gold all year. Uh, that's just finally coming to an end now. And I think, you know, Americans will, will rediscover gold. It may take $3,000 gold, which could happen later this year or early next year at the latest uh, to maybe get Americans interested again. Uh, but it's going to happen. And then the, the, you know, the buying is going to accelerate. But ultimately, when there is a real loss of confidence in the dollar, which is coming, and it starts to free fall and prices are spiraling out of control uh, because the inflation that's coming is going to dwarf what we've just experienced. I mean, if you think what we've had over the last few years is bad inflation and you ain't seen nothing yet, that was just a small taste of what's to come. We're going to see much bigger increases in consumer prices now that the Fed is, is back to actively creating inflation, which is what it's doing with these rate cuts. But more significantly, I think we're very close to a return to quantitative easing because the Fed is trying to lower interest rates. But even though it's cut short term rates, long term rates are now rising. They're higher now than they were when the Fed cut. And I think that upward pressure is going to continue. And I think when the 10 year Treasury breaks above 4 percent, it's now at three and three quarters. But I think once we break above four, 
the Fed is going to come back with QE, which is just massive inflation, because they're going to try to buy up bonds to try to force the yields down. Yeah, that's, I think that's a pretty accurate analysis. Do you think the banks are sort of, with, with seeing the interest rates cut, and it looks like we might get a quarter point cut in November, December, do you think the rate cuts will continue into, let's say, 2027? And do you think the banks have sort of reached their threshold of being able to paper down gold and silver at this point? Uh, you know, I don't know to what extent there was any kind of organized effort to limit the price of gold, but clearly it failed. I mean, the price of gold has gone up. In fact, so far this century, uh, gold prices have more than doubled their, the Dow. You know, mm -hmm. we started uh, 20, 20, 2001, the Dow was about 10,000, and now it's about 40,000. So the Dow is roughly four times where it was but gold is more than eight times higher than it was. So in real terms, the Dow has actually fallen. Uh, and, and, and that is gonna accelerate. I think the Dow is gonna lose a lot more value over the next 10 years relative to gold than it did in the past 20 years. You're gonna to start to see an acceleration. Uh, but it's not just the Dow. I mean, everything is gonna start losing a value and prices are gonna be going uh, much higher in terms of dollars, but they're gonna be going much lower in, in terms of gold. Yeah, it's interesting you say that because we we had a we have a monthly interview with uh, I'm sure you know Bill Holter and he was talking about similar to you about an interesting parabolic move of a, a hyperinflation of the things we need and a hyper deflation of the things we have. So it kind yeah, of exactly, says, you know, it's everything like we worst... need to buy gets more expensive and everything we already own uh, loses value. Yeah, it's like the worst of both worlds, so which actually, Peter, is a perfect segue, funny enough, to my next question to you. And I love that you said this. One of the many things that you've said that I've agreed with watching you over the years, uh, because we've been saying at our camp for a while, and that is I've heard you say many times on different podcasts that um, you see residential real estate market dropping somewhere between 80 to 90 percent. We've been saying along the same lines for years. Uh, somebody we've interviewed a lot, Lynette Zhang, is even saying as high as 95 percent if you're using cash. I guess the question, if you, I know you don't have a crystal ball, but from what you can see, when do you see the equity market plummeting, plummeting to that rate? And do you think those with cash or gold or silver or even, you know, yeah, Bitcoin no. or whatever will be able to buy well, land? When, when, when I talk about declines of, you know, 80, 90 percent, um, I'm talking about in terms of gold. I, I, I don't think there's any way you're going to see that kind of decline in dollars because the dollar is going to decline. Mm -hmm. And so it's a moving target. And, and, and as you know, the market tries to deflate prices, the government will inflate, right? Because the last thing the government wants is deflation. And they have the tools to prevent that. And they, they can print as much money as they want. And so I don't expect real estate prices to come down anywhere close to that in dollars. They, the real estate prices could actually go up in dollars. But in real terms, they're going way down. So, and what that means is uh, expressed in gold. So how many ounces of gold do you need to buy a house today versus how many ounces will you need to buy the same house tomorrow? And I think that in terms of gold, houses are gonna fall maybe 80 to 90%. But the way you may see that is with the price of gold going way up, but it's the same thing. It's just how much gold do you need to buy that house? And, and What's really happening is it's not that the gold is becoming more valuable. Your, your house is just becoming less or the, or the price is coming down. It's the same house. It provides the same utility. It's just that right now, things like houses and stocks are way overpriced mm -hmm. thanks to all the years of artificially low interest rates in this huge bubble. The bubble is going to pop. The air is going to come out and, and housing prices, housing you know, and, and stock prices in real terms are going to come way down. Now, if the government did the right thing, they would come down in nominal terms, too. But the government won't do the right thing. They are going to do everything they can to, to blow air back into the deflating bubble. Mm. And, and so the way you're going to see the, the deflation is through the prism of gold, right? If you price everything in gold, then you'll know what's actually happening. So do you think gold will help? Again, if we go into a gold standard, let's say next year, you think that'll help stabilize the old well, we're not get, we're not going to go to a gold standard next year. I mean, it's the, the government is going to be dragged 
kicking and screaming back to a gold standard. Because the reason the government got rid of the gold standard is because it stands in the way of everything they do to buy votes. Under a gold standard, you can't run big deficits. So you can't promise voters something for nothing. Mm -hmm. So if you want to provide a government program, you have to also uh, raise taxes to pay for it. <laughs> but that's not what politicians want to do. So uh, they, they took us off the gold standard so we can run massive deficits. We have a 35 plus trillion dollar national debt. We're running three, four trillion dollar a year budget deficits. This is impossible under a gold standard. And the only way to go back to a gold standard is to balance the budget. But they don't want to do that. I mean, they'll have to do it eventually, yeah. but it's going to take some time uh, before they, they surrender all that power and, and agree to go back. But what is going to, what's going to do it is going to be the chaos of a runaway inflation and how that's going to impact society. I guess, you know, we're, it's going to you know, be pretty dicey with uh, all sorts of rioting and mass protests. And mm -hmm. you know, I think that we are looking at price controls wage controls, which means shortages of, 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 of basic goods and services, um, long lines for food, for energy, rolling blackouts. <clears throat> I mean, a lot of bad stuff is going to happen as the government you know, resists uh, doing the right thing and, and, and keeps trying to you know, plug up all the holes in the dike as they keep popping up. Yeah. Uh, but at some point, you know, they're going to have to do something. Otherwise, it's just going to be complete chaos. Completely. Sounds a lot like the 70s. Not that I was there, but it sounds like a lot like the 70s on steroids. Well, it's going to be worse than the 70s because, yeah. you know, in the 1970s, we were in much better shape than we are now. And we were able to do the right thing at the end of the 70s. You know, mm -hmm. we put interest rates up at 20 percent in order to stop that. I mean, we can't get anywhere near 20% now. I mean, we could barely get to 5%. And, you know, by the way, this is going to be the best year for gold, the biggest gain in any one year since the 1970s. The mm -hmm. last time gold had a year that's going to be this big was 1979. But that was the end of the bull market because in 1980, the Fed responded with the big rate hikes. Now they're going to be cutting rates in 2025. So this, this is the beginning of another bull market in gold, not the end, like 1979. Yeah. This is more like 1971. Yeah, that makes, that makes a lot of sense. With, so with that in mind, Peter, if, if we see gold going runaway, how does silver uh, reflect against that? Silver's gonna go up too. I mean, silver's finally making a move today. It's up over 5%, which is a mm -hmm. big move. Yeah. It's back above $32 an ounce, but you know it was at $50 an ounce in 1980. So silver is very cheap. It did get back to 50 in 2011. I think we're going to take out 50 by next year, but it's possible we take it out before the end of this year. I wouldn't be shocked if in the next three months, silver goes from 32 to 50, you know, because it should already be there. It should be higher. Yeah. And I think gold could end the year above $3,000 an ounce, which would mean we'd be up 50% approximately on the year, uh, you know, which is a significant move. I mean, gold isn't just some random commodity. Mm -hmm. When you get this kind of move in gold, and it's already up better than 30% on the year, but when you get, or almost 30, it's up better than 25, gets close to 30 at this point. But when you get a move this big, uh, it is a warning that, you know, th th this is a harbinger of some bad times. You know, if you go back to Alan Greenspan, when he testified at the Humphrey Hoggins, you know, semi-annual testimony before Congress back in the early 2000s. He was asked specifically if he thought the U.S. would be better off on a gold standard because he was an advocate at one time of a gold standard. And he said, no, I think it's good now. But he said that it's like we're on a gold standard because he claimed that he uh, made monetary policy based on gold. So he said he watched the price of gold. And if gold was getting up to 400, that meant his policy was too loose and he needed to tighten policy and raise rates. And if gold went below 300, that meant he was too tight and he needed to loosen up. Mm. Right. So he said gold was an important indicator of whether the Fed had the right policy. Well, gold is going ballistic right now. What does that tell you? That tells you that monetary policy is too loose and the Fed just loosened it further which is why gold has been making record high after record high ever since the Fed cut rates. 
and it's not going to stop, right? And, and this is a harbinger of much higher prices because the dollar buys less gold, but it's going to buy less everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the hyperinflation part. And, and I think you're right also. I think that uh, we will see gold, I believe, somewhere between, you know, obviously, I don't know exactly, but somewhere between 3000 to 3500 I could see it before the end of the year with, uh, with what's happening, especially if they continue to cut rates. Um, interesting fact, going back to your education, Peter, since this is your first time here, uh, a fact I didn't know about you until researching was that you graduated from, if I have this correct, that you graduated from Beverly Hills High School in California and then got a degree in finance and accounting at Berkeley. I would think that if you lived in Beverly Hills, your family must have done fairly well, um, and you seem very conservative to have attended Berkeley College. Um, I think it's been considered quite a liberal institution since the 60s. Can you maybe talk a little bit about your experience there? Well, first of all, I, I grew up in the slum. I didn't actually grow up in Beverly Hills. We moved oh. there during high school. So I, yeah. I kind of finished up high school in Beverly Hills. But you know, we lived in the slums of Beverly Hills. So, we, you, know, my, my, you know, my parents weren't affluent. We, we weren't broke. Uh, but, you know, it, I, I didn't come from a wealthy family. And uh, my, my parents were divorced. So it was my mom mm. uh, and my brother and I. And we actually shared a bedroom. So we had like a two-bedroom, a duplex you know, okay. in the flats of Beverly Hills. So we weren't like living up in a big, uh, big house, uh, right. you know, north of Sunset or even north of Santa Monica. We were, you know, <laughs> we were yeah. south of Wilshire. So uh, if anyone knows the, you know, the, the Beverly Hills area, but I had some very wealthy friends. I mean, I, you know, um, sure. but I went to Berkeley and, you know, Berkeley was, you know, historically a very liberal school, you know, from the 1960s. Wasn't quite as liberal in the 80s. You know, I was there when, you know, Reagan was president, but it was still, you know, there's still a lot of left wingers there. I mean, my, 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 my teacher for, and I dropped the class immediately because I didn't want to sit through it, but I went for like a freshman political science class and the teacher was a Marxist, you know, kind of like Kamala Harris is that, you know, because I, I, I went to, I went to the first class and, and, and based on the things that she said, I was pretty outraged. So I, 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 I went to her office hours later that day. And I said, yeah, you know, I'm Peter Schiff. I'm in your, you know, you know class. I, I got to ask you a question because, you know, are you a communist? And she said, no, no, I'm not a communist. I'm a Marxist. I was like, all right, whatever, <laughs> fine. I'm, I'm out of this class. But yeah. I mean, but, and, but there were like a thousand kids, freshmen, and it's, it was a big class, you know, and it was being taught by, by a Marxist, except she didn't announce that she was a Marxist. I could just tell by the, the stuff she was saying. So, yeah. yeah, but, you know, but I was in the business school and so they weren't as crazy there. We had some more, uh, you know, less radical, maybe some even conservative professors in uh, business and the econ department. Although, you know, there was still a lot of Keynesians there. You know, they weren't Austrian economists. I mean, so what I know about economics, I didn't learn at Berkeley. I learned I learned from my dad mm. and then I learned from, you know, reading on my own, not not the stuff that they asked me to read at college, but the stuff I found you know, on my own or stuff that my, my dad, you know, gave me to read. Cool. Yeah. Thank you for that. I just want to kind of get a, a, a more accurate background on, on your educational background and what, you know, did and didn't occur. So thanks for, thanks for sharing that. Um, question here, Peter, we were talking about on the SEC earlier. So as you're probably aware, the SEC has till October 7th to decide if they're going to appeal the XRP decision. If they should opt to not appeal, that would then, we believe, send XRP ablaze and also be a tacit concession by the SEC that President Trump will ultimately win the election. Uh, and by proxy, would you imagine that Gary Gensler would step down because he knows President Trump is most likely going to get rid of him once he returns to the White House? I have no idea if he's going to you know, quit or wait to be fired, but he's, he's, <laughs> he's certainly... He's certainly on his way out. I mean, uh, I mean, I'm not a fan of Gensler's, but I have no idea who Trump is going to replace him with. But but I, but I do think that the people that Trump appoints will be far more likely to support a, a freer market than anyone that Harris is likely to uh, appoint. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I agree with that. So thank you. I just was kind of curious to get your feedback on that. Um, just just to kind of mop up another question we were talking about about the uh, rate cuts. And obviously last week we experienced a pretty, you know, intense one, 50 basis points. Uh, do you see us having more rate cuts for a prolonged period of time? Or do you think there'll be a, a certain period that they get cut off like 25, 26? How do you see the long-term forecast with rate cuts? Well, first of all, I, I had been forecasting the 50 basis point cut, um, you know, so it didn't surprise me. It was what I expected. Mm -hmm. And I, I do expect more cuts are coming. 
because the economy is going to weaken. Uh, the unemployment rate is going to rise. Yeah. And so the Fed is going to be under increased pressure to use its tools, right, to, to fix it, right? And, and it only has one tool, which is inflation, and so it's going to use it. But so it's going to cut rates. But I do believe that the rate cutting party is going to come to a premature end. I don't know that they're going to get down to zero this time because the bond market and it you know, may not allow it. But they're going to they're going to try and they're going to go back to QE. They're going to you know, but I think I think all of this is going to blow up in the Fed's face yeah. because it's going to expose finally what should have been exposed a long time ago, that the, the Fed is in this box that it's a paper tiger when it comes to inflation, that it really can't do anything about it, and, and that Treasury bonds are not a risk-free asset. They're actually not only a return-free asset, they are a guaranteed losing asset, that it's impossible to buy a Treasury and hold it to maturity and not lose money because interest rates are going to be held negative. And so if you lend money to the U.S. government, you're guaranteed to lose. And so then no one's going to want to lend money to the U.S. government anymore. No one's going to want to own dollars. No one's going to want to own U.S. treasuries. And then it's just a complete collapse. And then, you know, the, the Fed is going to have to do something completely different. Uh, otherwise, it's hyperinflation, which is still not, you know, off the table. That's still, you know, a, a, a potential worst case scenario that the dollar, you know, becomes completely worthless. But, but hopefully we don't let it get that bad. But it's going to get really bad before we do something to prevent it from getting that bad. But yeah. preventing that from happen, happening is going to require a radical departure from previous policy and admission by the government that it can't do anything to help and that we now have to take our medicine. Right? We, we have to pay the piper. This is it. Yeah. Get, you know, we, no more kicking a can down the road. The right. road is over. Right? We got to deal with the problem. And that means, unfortunately, a lot of people are going to lose a lot of money. That's just reality. And especially if you've been promised benefits from the government, you're just not going to get what you were promised. You know, somebody has to deliver the bad news and, and accept responsibility for it. Well, like you said, it's been a long time coming. So at some point it had to end. And, um, you know, I'm glad you brought up actually the bond market, because like you said, you know, I believe that and I'm here, I don't curious to take your take. I don't want to make any presumptions, but it seems like the only people that are going to buy the debt would be the Federal Reserve because it's clear that no other countries really want it. Um, a good example would be the next question I have for you, uh, Peter, which is we see Japan hammering economically under the weight of holding our worthless treasury bonds. And we know that they've been buying gold, un not unlike China and a lot of other countries, and it's devaluing their currency up to 25% ultimately to give it some type of stability going forward. Um, do you see Japan joining BRICS sooner than later and possibly by the end of this year? Well, I mean, I don't know if they join the BRICS in some kind of official like alliance, but I do think they're gonna have to give up the ghost and they're gonna have to let interest rates rise uh, and, and deal with the consequences of rising rates because the Japanese government now has massive debt uh, as a consequence of keeping rates too low for too long. And part of the problem was they were in, in, in pursuit of this elusive goal or ridiculous goal of having higher inflation. Uh, you know, they bought into that myth uh, that we need inflation and it needs to be 2%. Uh, and so in order to push up inflation, they created uh, uh, you know, a lot more of it. And, and now it's a ticking time bomb for the Japanese. Inflation is now way above 2%, if you, especially if you measure it accurately yet they still have rates at 25 basis points mm -hmm. because they're afraid of collapsing the stock market and the real estate market and you know bankrupting the government or the government wouldn't be bankrupt in Japan it would just force the government to raise taxes massively or cut spending things that they don't want to do uh, or potentially sell off assets like their US treasuries which would be a smart thing to do yeah. uh, but that is eventually going to happen you know the Japanese are going to have to allow the yen to go up they're going to have to allow rates to go up, allow stock prices to come down, real estate prices to go down. It's going to happen. Um, but at least Japan is still rich enough to do the right thing. I don't think we are. We're so broke at this point. We have we owe so much money that we don't even have the, 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 the potential. We have to default on our debt. Uh, and if we don't default, we're going to inflate it away. But either way, our creditors aren't going to get their money. It's just not even within the realm of possibility. Yeah. Yeah, it's again, we're coming to a to an end point here.
Um, several years ago, Peter, I saw a video where you debated the pros of owning gold against Bitcoin. What would impress me was that you were um, dressed appropriately and professionally for the debate, unlike your opponent, and you defended your position without any notes. Do you still feel the same way about gold <laughs> compared to a Bitcoin today? And if you do, can you kind of give our audience your best reason for owning physical gold along with Bitcoin, maybe? Yeah, well, first of all, I've done a lot of Bitcoin versus gold debates and the standard attire for the Bitcoiners is a t-shirt. <laughs> so, <laughs> Big, right. you know, and again, you know, that's the, the young generation, you know, they, they, you know, they think a, a collared shirt or a tie or a sport coat, you know, that's old school, you know, that's, you know, the boomers. And so they want to show that they're, you know, that they're, they're with it right and hip. Right. And so right. they, you know, they'll, they'll wear, they'll wear a t-shirt. Um, but yeah, you know, I, I think that uh, Bitcoin, you know, it was a great opportunity for the people who got in real early and who have been cashing out these last few years, they, they, they made a killing. It was a great uh, pump and dump uh, uh, promotional trade uh, where you create something that's basically worthless and create a lot of demand for it and, and then sell into that demand. And that's basically what's happened. But they, they've packaged and promoted Bitcoin as if it was digital gold. Uh, and so that's the basis upon which people buy it because they think it's better than gold. It's digital gold, right? And so digital is better than analog, right? And, and so Bitcoin must be better than gold because it's, you know, it's digital. <laughs> but of course, it's not really digital gold, no more than a picture of a hamburger is digital food. Uh, you know, you can't, you can't use Bitcoin for anything that you use gold for, right? So it's not a digital version of gold, it's, it's nothing. It, 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 you know, they can make a Bitcoin look like a gold coin, but it's got nothing in common with a gold coin. But, you know, people have been convinced. And, and, and one of the, the main things that's got so many people believing in it is how much the price has gone up because it was pennies of Bitcoin and now it's 63,000. And, and so people use the appreciation to prove that, it, that it's better than gold because it's gone up more than gold. But if that's the case, it's better than everything because it's gone up more than everything. It's gone up more than real estate. It's gone up more than stocks. So why own stocks or real estate? Just, just buy gold, right? The right. fact that Bitcoin has done better than gold is irrelevant. You know, it's done better because it's just a massive bubble. That's why it's done better. Now, what nobody wants to talk about is the fact that gold, I mean, Bitcoin actually peaked out almost three years ago and it's down over 30% priced in gold over the past three years, despite all the ETFs, El Salvador, MicroStrategy and, 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 uh, and, 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 Mike and Sailor, um, all these conferences, 20,000 people at the last Bitcoin conference in, in Nashville, right? Mm -hmm. Super Bowl commercials, you know, uh, NFTs, uh, you know, all the uh, all the Wall Street adoption, the hedge funds, despite all this buying gold, Bitcoin hasn't gone up. Now it hasn't crashed, but it hasn't gone up. So what does that tell you? That tells me that the big money has been selling, as the little money has been getting in. Right. So this has been the exit, and we're forming a major uh, distribution top where the Bitcoin is going from the strong hands who got in early to the weak hands that are getting in late. And then there's going to be a rug pull and the bottom's going to drop out of the market. I feel bad. All these people who bought Bitcoin at, you know, 50,000, 60,000, 70,000, when it's at 10,000, 5,000, 1,000, they're going to be wiped out. Um, you know, but, you know, the money they lose equals the money that the other people made who cashed out because it's, it's it, they're, they're, Bitcoin itself doesn't produce any, any wealth. It doesn't generate any, any returns. So if one person makes money, it's just because somebody else lost it. Do you think it'll go? So with that in mind, do you think it'll go to zero or do you think it's going to hit a certain threshold? Well, you know, even bankrupt companies don't go to zero, right? People still trade the stocks. I mean, there's always hope. So, I, you know, I think, I mean, it'll take a long time before nobody wants to buy a Bitcoin and, mm -hmm. it, and it goes to zero. But it doesn't have to go to zero. I mean, even if Bitcoin stopped falling at $1,000, right? If you buy it at 60,000, does it really make a difference if it goes to 1,000 or zero? I mean, you've pretty much lost all of your money. 
right? So going down 99%, 99.5%. Now, the only person it will make a difference to is the person who then buys it at 1,000. Because if someone buys it at 1,000 and then it goes to 500, well, they've lost half their money. But if you've already lost 99% of your money, losing half of what's of the 1% that's left isn't going to bother you. So I don't know, you know if it's going all the way to zero. Um, but if it goes to 1,000 or when it goes to 1,000, I doubt I'll buy it. <laughs> so I'll, I, I, you know, I, you know, if it can go to 1,000, it can go to 100, right? right. So that's 90% down. Why, why would I want to risk buying it? Sure. I just want to but, kind so of see. I, I, you know, I don't know, but I, I think the whole thing is just a complete Ponzi pyramid chain letter. I, I call it a blockchain letter because that's really, really what it is because it's a chain letter on a blockchain. Mm -hmm. uh, but mm -hmm. it's the same principle of a chain letter and chain letters are illegal, right? They're illegal for a reason because they don't work. But yes, if you get in on a chain letter early enough, you can make money, right? Like the people who got into Bitcoin early, they, they made a bunch of money. But it's illegal because eventually people lose a lot of money. And that's what's going to happen with Bitcoin and all the other cryptos out there. There's tens of thousands of these things. Okay, so what I'm saying, I'm glad you brought that up. The other cryptos take the flip side of the coin. We we're just talking about the SEC and them releasing the appeal here soon on XRP. XRP certainly looks like it has potential to be part of the new uh, digital blockchain with, uh, you know, some of these other nations. What are your thoughts on uh, XRP? Yeah, no, I, I, I think ultimately, in order for the tokens to have value, they have to be backed by something. So if you want to tokenize gold and put it on a blockchain, yeah, that's fine. They, you know, the tokens have value. That's just like a, fiat, a, a currency backed by gold. A, right. a cryptocurrency backed by gold would be the same thing. It could work. In mm -hmm. fact, a, 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 a crypto backed by gold would work even better than paper backed by gold because of all the advantages that they like to tout about Bitcoin. Very easy to transfer. Uh, very easy to divide. Uh, so we can actually run a modern day gold standard with a blockchain a lot more efficiently uh, than we ran uh, the old school uh, a gold standard uh, without, without the digital world. So you can digitize gold in a sense that you take actual gold and tokenize its ownership, right? You can't tokenize the actual gold. The gold needs to be stored someplace. But what you can tokenize is the ownership. And I don't have to transfer my gold to you. I just have to transfer my ownership of that gold to you. And I can, uh, I can settle a payment. And so we can trade with one another by trading uh, ownership of gold. Well, the gold itself just stays in one place. And so that would work great. And so it, to the extent that crypto has a future in the monetary system, that's how it's going to work. Yeah, yeah, and I and I agree with you. And I think at some point they are going to asset back them because it's the only way it can really, like you said, be sustainable. Um, last question for today, Peter, because I do want to respect your time. We have an immensely important event slated, as you know, for October twenty second to twenty fourth, with respect to the BRICS summit in Moscow. Uh, roughly one hundred and sixty nations are being represented and said to be at the event. Over eighty percent of the world's population. Um, do you believe this might be the seminal black swan event moment where, whereby they ditch the dollar as the hegemony currency and as a result, nationalize their own currencies powering up in said gold, silver and other things uh, as, as part of a real time settlements and transaction? Yeah, you know, it's obviously a significant meeting that will be completely lost on the American media mm. you know, because we're still very arrogant <laughs> in our assumptions about our place in the world and right and and where the rest of the world lies. Um, but I doubt that they're just going to come out and, and just make an official announcement that, OK, we're off the dollar. It's just going to happen. I don't think they're, they're going to ring a bell and say, ah, this is it. Uh, you're, you're, we're going to have to figure that out based on what's happening in the market. So you're not going to get a warning like, OK, get rid of your dollars. <laughs> you know, they won't have very any value tomorrow or whatever mm -hmm. or the next week. Uh, people are going to have to, you know, read between the lines. It, it, it may not be that hard to do that. But yes, the world is moving away. And to the extent that there's a big uh, convention in Moscow, you know, really is, uh, a, 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 you know, a thumb in the, in the eye of the U.S. Mm -hmm. because we've got sanctions against Russia. So <laughs> anybody coming to that uh, meeting, you know, is basically, you know, thumbing their nose at the U.S. saying, look, I, we, we're going to Moscow. 
even though you know, you know, they're the supposed enemy and you've sanctioned them and they're in this war with, with the Ukraine. Um, so yeah, I mean, the fact that this is happening, this is part of the warning signs that everybody is ignoring, uh, mm -hmm. that these countries that we need, we depend on to buy our debt and supply us with goods that we don't produce, that they're revolting, you know, uh, and, and they don't want to continue with this system anymore because they have gotten the short end of the stick. They do all the hard work and we just get to consume what they produce. You know, right. They do all the saving and we do all the borrowing. You know, that, 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 that isn't uh, a, a good deal. It's been a, a great deal for us. We've been, you know, having a ride on the global gravy train, but the people that have been uh, making the train uh, run, you know, you know, are tired of watching the Americans get a free ride, you know, while well, they can't afford tickets. Yeah, very understandable. I, you see it from their standpoint, like you said. So it sounds like it might be, in your opinion, more of a clandestine effort where they just kind of subtly do it and there's not a lot of fanfare. Is that fair to say? Yeah, although when it's finally completed, they may make an announcement, but it will be pretty obvious that something has happened. But, you know, they're not going to say stuff in advance because let's say they need to buy a lot more gold. The last thing they do want to do is push up the price even more. They, mm -hmm. want, to, they want to buy as much gold as they can right. uh, without showing their full their intentions right yeah I, sorry I, I do have one other quick question related to this i apologize but i'm thinking what is that okay let's say they do it then what does that do to the dollar index when the dollar index have to step down a little bit to make room for what they're doing oh well, yeah the dollar index i think is going to get killed so as we're talking right now the dollar index is still holding on to a hundred handle uh i expect that to be given up you know before the end of the year and we mm -hmm. may end up you know, around 90 by the end of this year, uh, especially if Harris wins. I think that will put even more downward pressure on the dollar, but I think it's going down regardless. But I think what's going to happen in 2025 is the dollar index is going to get down towards 70 again, which was about the all time record low mm -hmm. in, in 2008, just before the financial crisis, ironically saved the dollar. Um, but mm -hmm. I think at that point, you know, that's when we're going to be, you know, at the, the crisis level, because if the Fed can't do the right thing, the dollar is going to collapse and it'll, you know, go down to 50, go down to 40. I mean, it's going to free fall. In fact, we're yeah. already just out at a 13 year low against the Swiss franc. And I think that by the end of this year, the dollar could hit an all time record low against the Swiss franc. And if not by the end of this year uh, in Q1 and next year. And you know that is a, a a a big warning sign, because you know this this Swiss franc. When they talk about the cleanest dirty shirt in the hamper, this Swiss franc is probably that shirt. I mean, they're they're all dirty, but but you sure. can really look at the Swiss franc uh, as 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 a proxy for confidence in the dollar, because you know people are buying the franc instead of the dollar. That's why the dollar is so weak against the franc, um, and and so you know you're seeing this, and I think the Swiss franc is kind of leading the way and the other currencies will will follow um, because if the dollar really was strong, it would be strong against the Swiss franc too. That's a good point. So it sounds like if I'm reading you right, potentially by Q1, like you said, uh, we could be looking at potentially a Fibonacci effect. On what? On the dollar. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, look, <clears throat> what what really saved us, the reason that we didn't collapse after the 08 financial crisis was because everybody started buying dollars. Mm -hmm. And the reason we got away with all the deficits after COVID was because of people were still buying dollars and we were able to finance uh, the deficits, you know, <clears throat> globally. But I, I think now that's over. In fact, the main reason that the CPI, which had reached a peak of like 9%, nine and a quarter year over year, and now it's down around three and the Fed is confident it's going to keep falling to two, even though it's been banging around three for about a year now. The main reason was that we had over a 20 percent rise in the dollar. Uh, it was the strong dollar that brought down oil prices, which right now oil prices are about as low as they've ever been. Mm -hmm. If you measure the price of oil in terms of gold, oil has never been this cheap outside of a month or two under, you know, when it went negative during, you know, COVID. But Oil is actually a huge bargain right now. It's, it's as cheap as it's ever been. 
Uh, and, and that's because we, you know, we had a rise in the dollar that brought down copper, that brought down other prices. But now the dollar's starting to fall again. Right. And now those prices are starting to come back up, and that's going to filter into headline CPI. So just as the Fed has claimed victory over inflation and is cutting rates, inflation is getting ready to spike up and head to new highs. And that's what's going to be the big problem for the Fed and for the U.S. financial markets is when they start to see the rising inflation. But at the same time, they're going to get more weak economic data, especially related to employment and mm -hmm. uh, manufacturing. So the Fed is going to get bad economic data and bad inflation data. And so that's why it's, it's stuck between this uh, rock and a hard place where it's damned if it does and, and damned if it doesn't. But the, the, the politically expedient path to take is inflation. And, and so that's what they're going to do. And of course, they'll always blame the inflation on other people. They'll blame it on speculators. They'll blame it on greedy businessmen. They can blame it more on Putin. I don't know. What they're, you know maybe they'll blame it on me, right? <laughs> so, for telling people to buy gold. I, Peter Schiff did it. <laughs> but yeah, I don't yeah, know. yeah. The boogeyman. They'll yeah. never accept responsibility. That we know. So it's really the perfect storm, ultimately, is what you're talking about. So, well, thank oh, you yeah. so much. Thank you so much, Peter Schiff, for being here. It's an honor to have you. Um, what we always do on our podcast, let you know, is uh, tell people where, where we can find your work, your various websites, and any last thoughts that you have for the audience, respectively, today. Uh, sure. Well, first of all, I do my own podcast, the Peter Schiff Show podcast. Uh, you know, I do them at least once a week, sometimes twice, or, you know, rare occasions, three, depending on really what's going on in my schedule. Um, but you can listen at shiftradio.com. You can listen you know, iTunes or any place they have podcasts, my podcast is there. Um, and you can watch it on YouTube. On my, if you want to see me, go to YouTube because I do them live and there's, there's video. Hmm. So there's a lot of ways to watch a podcast. Definitely follow me on social media. I'm the most active on X. Got over a million followers there. I post uh, several times a day. It's all me. So if I get a thought I want to communicate or there's some, somebody says something dumb and I want to <laughs> critique it, uh, you'll get that on, on X, so you should follow me there. But I'm, again, I'm also on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, even TikTok. So you, should, you can find me on these social media platforms and then follow me. But most importantly is to protect your wealth. I mean, that's one of the main things I'm trying to do other than educate people to understand uh, capitalism. And so they know that this crisis is not a failure of capitalism, but a failure to have capitalism, a failure of government and socialism uh, and central banking. But you got to protect your wealth. That means you got to convert your fiat savings into real money, into gold. And, and you can do that by contacting Shift Gold. And there you'll make sure you know, you're going to get a good price, low price on bullion, whether it's bar, in the form of bars or coins. We'll make sure that you, you, you don't pay a lot over spot and you get you know, into, into the safety of, uh, of real money for your savings. For your portfolios, if you have retirement accounts or any investment accounts, it's important that you move out of overpriced U.S. stocks, which are in a massive bubble, uh, overpriced U.S. bonds, and get a more defensive portfolio that will defend you against inflation, stagflation, a weak dollar. Those are the kind of portfolios that we create and manage at Euro Pacific Capital, uh, Euro Pacific Asset Management, excuse me. So you can contact us at Europac.com. Or you can also um, buy my mutual funds. I have a family of five funds that I manage. They're available. In fact, all the funds have a no-load version. Uh, you can buy them at any of the major discount brokers. But you can get information on those funds and the ticker symbols on the Europac website when you just you know, go to the website and, and, and click on the funds. Or you can talk to one of the representatives about the funds. We also offer wrap programs at your Pacific Asset Management where we'll manage your portfolio within the basket of our funds. Uh, so now you have a, a, a secondary layer of asset allocation on top of the, the management that takes place inside the funds. And of course, we also do separately managed accounts. So if you have a larger amount of money, we will create a portfolio for you and then manage that portfolio. Uh, so you can get more information there at europac.com. And oh, my latest endeavor, I have a free newsletter that goes out several times a week. You can sign up for it at shiftsovereign.com. Uh, and there's also, you know, a premium service. You can learn about that as well. But at minimum, sign up for the free service. Uh, it's, it's worth the money. It's a, it's a bargain. Yes, no, for sure. 
Peter Schiff, thank you for being here, good sir. We appreciate it. We look forward to having you again on in the future on a podcast. And thanks so much for your time and expertise. Oh, my pleasure. Take care. Take care.